My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a Hollywood film and television editor, a documentary director, father of two, an American ninja warrior in training, and the creator of Optimize Yourself. For over 10 years now, I have obsessively searched for every possible way to optimize my own creative and athletic performance, and now I'm here to shorten your learning curve. Whether you're a creative professional who edits, writes, or directs, you're an entrepreneur, or even if you're a weekend warrior, I strongly believe that you can be successful without sacrificing your health or your sanity in the process. You ready? Let's design the optimized version of you. Hello, and welcome to the Optimize Yourself podcast. If you're a brand new optimizer, I welcome you and I sincerely hope that you enjoy today's conversation. If you are inspired to take action after listening today, why not tell a friend about this show and help spread the love? And if you're a longtime listener and optimizer OG, welcome back. Whether you're brand new or you're a seasoned vet, if you have just 10 seconds today, it would mean the world to me if you clicked the subscribe button in your podcast app of choice because the more people that subscribe, the more that iTunes and the other platforms can recognize this show, and thus the more people that you and I can inspire to step outside their comfort zones to reach their greatest potential. As creative professionals in the gig economy, it is virtually impossible for all of us to follow a single path that leads to success. We're not doctors and lawyers. Even if we put in the work and we do as we are told, we can still end up miserable on the same projects year after year after year, as opposed to working on projects that creatively fulfill us. Heck, we can seemingly do all of the right things and even invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in advanced education and degrees, and we still end up fetching people's coffee. So what is the difference between those working consistently on dream projects that they love versus those who just spin on the hamster wheel of projects and dead-end jobs that go nowhere? There are those who wait for opportunities to come to them, and then there are those who create their own opportunities. Assistant editor and co-creator of the Master the Workflow program, Richard Sanchez, he's belonged to both camps. In the past, he found himself taking the same jobs over and over that didn't really move him forwards. But after listening to my podcast interview with the creators of Cobra Kai, where I systematically broke down my own process to create my dream job, something inside Richard changed. He realized the only thing standing between him and his dream project was himself. This realization was step one in a series of steps that slowly changed the direction of Richard's career and led him to working on his dream project, Bill and Ted Face the Music. Listen in to learn more about what specific steps Richard took to open the right door at the right time and create his own opportunities so that you too can follow the same steps to create your own path to a more fulfilling career. Now, as a quick author's note before we jump in, this interview was conducted shortly before the pandemic struck in early March. So as you're listening, I want you to keep that in mind as we discuss things like going out for lunch, going out for meetings, et cetera, et cetera. It'll all make a lot more sense if you understand we recorded this before the world went to crap. If you're inspired by Richard's journey today and you would like to up your networking game, specifically your outreach emails, then I invite you to download a free copy of my insider's guide to writing great outreach emails. In this guide, I break down the process of writing outreach emails so you understand exactly what will get you a response. I'll teach you why cold outreach is the most important soft skill you must develop if you want to advance your career especially during global pandemics. I'll show you the five most common mistakes that people make when they write their outreach messages, and then I will break down step by step how to write an amazing outreach message that will actually get a response so you can seek advice, connect with a potential mentor, and build the right relationships so that when the job market does open again, you are at the top of people's lists. To download this brand new guide for free, visit optimizeyourself.me slash email guide, all one word. All right, after a brief break to recognize the sponsor of this episode, my conversation with assistant editor and co-creator of Master the Workflow, Richard Sanchez. To access the show notes for this and all previous episodes, as well as to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspirational interview, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash podcast. 
This episode is made possible for you by, you guessed it, ErgoDriven, the creators of the Topo Mat, my number one recommended product if you are interested in moving more and not having sore feet at your height adjustable or standing workstation. Almost every new person that I meet in this industry starts our conversation with, hey, I got a Topo Mat because of you. It changed my life. Thank you. If you are not standing on one today, I cannot recommend it enough. It's super comfortable, it's an awesome conversation starter, and by the way, it's also scientifically proven to help you move more throughout your workday. To learn more and get your topo mat, visit optimizeyourself.me slash topo. That's T-O-P-O. I'm here today with Richard Sanchez, who is a visual effects editor as well as an assistant editor that moves between features and television. And you are also the co-creator of Master the Workflow's feature film assistant editor immersion program, which has become quite the phenomenon in our little niche industry of the world right now. So Richard, I'm so excited we we're finally able to get this conversation on the record today. Thank you. Been, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Yes, this has been in the works behind the scenes many, many email threads ago, many <laughs> months ago, where we decided we wanted to make this happen. And uh, it just goes to show how insanely busy everybody is in this industry when all we need to do is get on the microphone for an hour, but finding the time for both of us to have the same hour available in any given period of the day is virtually impossible. Yeah, I mean, I think when we first started talking about this, well, for one, I was not a father yet. And uh, there was an awful lot that happened uh, between then and now. Well, the, the other thing that I think that is, uh, has happened, which is really the, the main reason that you came to me in the first place, is that uh, in the process of you reaching out to where you are now, you've been working on a pretty cool project, if I'm, uh, if I'm so inclined to ask. Yes? Yes. Uh, you know, I've been working on a project that I've been a fan of since I was a little kid. I am VFX editing on Bill and Ted Face the Music. Oh, dude, you have no idea, by the way, how excited <laughs> about this movie. I get, I seldom get very excited about new films that are coming out, especially remakes. But one of those, like, oh, I totally have to go see this in the theater. Yeah, you know, it's funny. This is maybe the third time in my entire career that I've worked on a show that I was a fan of before I worked on it. And it's interesting because it kind of opens up a whole new dynamic uh, as to how one conducts oneself in that when you when you come onto a job that, Maybe it's, you know, it's the first season of a show. There's no expectation. There's no nothing. So it might be good. It might not be. We've all done both. But in a project like this, I find the challenge is I want to geek out on everybody. And you have to kind of step back and go, be professional. This is your job. Yes, be professional. I've, I've been in a situation <laughs> twice now where, yes, you're correct that even if you're on something that becomes a global or national phenomenon, if you started at the beginning of it when those characters and those storylines really didn't mean anything, it didn't have that weight, you grow with the project. But because you've kind of been behind the scenes and you've watched how they make the sausage, so to speak, you don't, you don't get into it as much and you might enjoy it, but it's, it's different because you're not seeing it from the outside looking in. Um, but Twice now I've been on projects uh, with first Burn Notice, where I was a huge fan of the show yeah. before I got on it. And then Cobra Kai, which is like a whole <laughs> nother level of like geekdom. I mean, for, for somebody that were to say, I grew up on Star Wars and now I'm cutting it. That's how I feel about Cobra Kai and the Karate Kid. Um, it's like to this day, I still think to myself, oh my God, I'm, I'm editing Johnny and I'm editing Daniel. And like, it's, it's ridiculous. So um, I can only imagine the, the nerding out that you must do on a regular basis. Well, f fun fact with uh, Karate Kid, this was just me as a little kid because my only frame of reference was movies because I was just kind of that kind of geek. I remember when I was young, and this is before everybody had you know TV screens in their car, I would get really grumpy when I'd have to go on long drives with my parents, and I would basically time out how long a drive was based on how long I could be watching a movie. And in particular, the one that sticks in my head was Karate Kid 2. Mm. I was like, San Luis Obispo, that's Karate Kid 2 twice. <laughs> <laughs> How many karate kids is it for this next trip? Yeah, exactly. That's the metric. <laughs> that, that's an amazing unit of measurement right there. I have to remember that one. Yeah. Uh, well, well, the what I really want to understand and talk about more is how you actually landed the gig. But before we get there, I want to start a little bit earlier. I want to understand just a little bit more about what your career journey looks like in general, specifically the origin story, because we're going to talk a lot about this process of moving forward 
forwards in your career, advancing, finding specific strategies to really land the dream job that you want. But I want to know where things started. So just kind of walk me through your origin story. Yeah. So, I mean, the funny thing is long before I had any interest in editing at all, I wanted to be a score composer. I think the the movie that really kind of the fuel that fire for me was Braveheart. And I was just obsessed with that James Horner score. And uh, I was a musician at the time and I took a music theory class in high school and just absolutely hated it. And I realized if I was going to continue taking music theory courses, I was going to hate music and I didn't want to hate music. So I thought it was better for me to abandon music theory studies and do something different so I could continue to like music. Uh, And that's when I discovered theater. And through junior college, I was a theater major. I went to UC Irvine and studied theater. And ultimately, the way it hit me was I was always a big fan of computers and technology. And in my final quarter, because UCI is on the quarter system as opposed to semester, uh, I had to take a studio art class to complete my major. And I was dead set on taking black and white photography. And the girl I was dating at the time said, you should take an editing class. And my response to that was, why? Why would I do that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm right there with you. (laughs) You know, was was it a similar thing for you? For me, like I took my first class and I was like, oh my God, this is all I want to do with the rest of my life. Yeah, well, for me, that moment was when I was nine. So uh, yeah, it was a very similar story. And I've I've probably told it on this show at least a dozen times now. So I don't want to go into it too deeply. But for those that don't know my origin story to very briefly go over it, I was nine years old. I had spent the entire weekend running around my house with my bigger brother who had a VHS over the shoulder camcorder. Nice. And uh, we went through the whole process. And at the end, and we were doing it all in camera. So we were editing um, in, you know, you just say start and, you know, start and stop and try to get the edits as good as you can. And after two full days, he had me step up to the the eyepiece and watch it. And I was like, that's it. Are you serious? All this work? And it's like nine minutes. What a waste of time. <laughs> Which to this day is how I feel about being on set. Can't stand it. So two weeks later, he shows up with a VHS tape of exactly what he had shown me, but it had the score to the good, the bad and the ugly on it. Nice. I just I looked at it and I swear it was like experiencing porn for the first time. I was like, <laughs> this is the coolest thing ever. And I was like, how did you do that? So he showed me how he had the two VHS decks set up where the, the audio was running from a cassette deck and the video was running from the VHS deck. And he hit play and record on all three. I was like, oh, my God, teach me. Yeah. And, you know, cut to 31 years later, and I'm still kind of doing the same thing, just with better technology. So, yeah, I I can relate to that feeling. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, from there, it was one of those things where, you know, I mean, I worked out out of college. I worked at Starbucks for, God, like five years, which was a surprisingly good place to meet people working in the field. But ultimately, um, got my start in reality television, worked there for Uh, I don't know, two to three years at the time. I got my start on Final Cut. So, uh, you know, got my start in reality TV, did the night gig back when we were on tape. I remember digitizing uh, DVC Pro HD tapes and uh, laying back to D5 and uh, eventually made my way into scripted television, learned the Avid. And funny enough, I didn't think I was ever going to get into features. I hit a point where, you know, I'd been doing it for several years. I was probably... 34 at the time. And I kind of felt like I was getting to that point where if it wasn't going to happen soon, it was never going to happen. So I just said, okay, I'm never going to work in features. I'm, uh, but scripted television is cool. I like this. And then I had an opportunity to work on a tier one, super low budget action movie. And it was one of those things where it's like, okay, if you do this and you're going to play the long game, you're going to stay an assistant editor for a while. And by this time, most of my friends who had uh, who I'd come up with as an assistant editor in reality, they were all long editing. And it can be difficult when your long game is, I want to edit. You see all these people around you and you go, God, they're editing too. Like, what's up? Is it me? But I think it's really important that you look at yourself and look at what you want to do and say, it's like, that's not my path. I want to do something different. And if that's what you want, just stick with it. And, and the, the hard thing too is that that will always come with a financial hit. You know, you, yeah, you'll make a ton more money editing reality than you will staying in the system a while. But, you know, that, that was just my path. 
So that's kind of led me there. And, you know, from, from there, it was just, you know, it was just the snowball effect. Did one super low budget action movie. And then from there, I got on my second feature almost right away with Larry Jordan, who later became my business partner with the Master of the Workflow product. Although that, it wasn't even on that film. That was the first film we worked on, a super low budget film with, I mean, with all these great comedians that if you tried to get them in one movie now, it would cost you $40 million. I mean, it was a film called Flock of Dudes. And we had Kumel Nanjiani, uh, Eric Andre, Chris D'Elia, Hannibal Burris, Brett Gelman. Uh, there was this great cameo by Jeff Ross. I mean, these great comedians at the time who were just kind of still coming into their own themselves. And yeah, just, just the snowball effect, you know, a few years later and on. I mean, if you would have told me back then, one day you'll be working on the sequel to Bill and Ted, I'd be like, yeah, it's, that's funny. But yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. Like it's you never going to happen, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I definitely want to understand how all that transpired and I want to move ahead. But I want to go backwards first. So the the point of your story that I actually think might be the most important for the people listening are the one that you glossed over in maybe half a breath at most, <laughs> which was, so I started on reality. I was working at nights. Then I moved to script to television and blah, blah, blah. And everybody listening is like, wait a second. How did you do that? Right. And I'm assuming this is something you now see all the time with the people that are coming to the Master of the Workflow program. And we can get into the details of the program later. But I'm assuming that most of the people that are coming to it are probably people in reality that are saying, how do I make the transition to scripted? What do I need to know? So how did you make that transition? So my first scripted show, it, I was fortunate to work on a show that was a scripted show masquerading as a reality show. And there's a surprise Surprisingly high number of shows like that. In fact, I've done two in my career. The first one was there was a show in the in the late '90s called Greg the Bunny on Fox. Mm -hmm, I remember that. And so this one was it was a spinoff of that called Warren the Ape for MTV. And it's a shame that the show didn't get a second season and didn't get more attention because. It was a funny show. And I don't say that just because I worked on it. I mean, I still laugh about some of the stories. And funny enough, that's where I met Sean Baker, who went on to go do Tangerine and is now killing it with the Florida Project and all his other projects, you know. Uh, but that was my first step into scripted. It was, it was a show done in the style of a reality show, but it was with puppets. And, you know, and so they needed someone who kind of understood reality because that was the style of it, but it was very much a scripted show, but it was shot very loosely. And it was great in a, many senses too, because it really allowed me to get fun and creative with After Effects. I've actually always loved After Effects and we didn't have the budget to have an, a VFX house. So I was doing it all myself and it, it was cool. You know, it's like, you know, just utilizing all these techniques that I'd learned over the years, you know, spent a lot of time learning After Effects using videocopilot.net, which is free. And seriously, if anybody wants to learn After Effects, go there. It's amazing. I can't say enough good things about it. And yeah, I, and funny enough, I did a show in the same style later, this show called Real Husbands of Hollywood with uh, Kevin Hart. And so that was, it, it was kind of a hybrid style. And, you know, that one, funny enough, I think I got the interview of all places from entertainmentcareers.net. Like one of those websites that never has, never seems to have links. And then one day they just kind of do. And so the one thing I always say, because I always get a little annoyed when, when people bring up, you know, luck, because I think, I think it's, it, it can be a bit of a lazy thing to say, oh, you just got lucky. And my rationale is, Luck might get you an interview. It will not get you through the interview. You know, it's like you need to know what you're talking about when you get in the interview. And when you get the job, you need to know how to do the work, you know. So there's something to be said about luck being the start of a conversation. Because I certainly would be lying to myself if I said that wasn't kind of a lucky break. But also, you know, the whole notion of you make your own luck by just being bold and you know you find you find those ads and, and another another story I'll share too is one about not being overly proud because I once had the opportunity to work on a humongous film that I almost didn't take because they wanted a graveyard shift and I felt like I was at a point in my career where it's just like I can't do graveyard I'm just I I'm past that point in my career I'm not going to do it and fortunately I had a friend who had more foresight than I did at the time and he figured out what the show was and he goes Richard 
you have to apply for that. And I was like, why? What is it? And it was Suicide Squad, which, you know, again, you can say what you want about the film because, you know, we all know how well it did, but I didn't care. It was awesome. There was awesome people on it. And I was proud as hell to have been a part of it. And so that, you know, kind of one of those things where you see that gig and they're always cryptic about the good jobs. You know, they never say the name, you know, you're never going to see Chris Nolan going to be on my film. It's going to be, you know, some guy needs someone, Hey, can you do it? And you know, that's the tricky thing about it too, is, you know, you're like, okay, that sounds kind of cool. And, and the notion of if you're on a job at the time you go, you know, nobody wants to burn bridges, but you're like, Oh, this might be an opportunity. So you know, there's a bit of a leap of faith involved and, uh, and persistence. So uh, along this idea of luck, hard work, persistence, all these various ideas, and I'm, I'm glad that you used the word luck in the right context because anybody that has listened to the show more than once knows how annoyed I get when my guests say, well, I just got lucky. Oh, my God, do I tear them a new one every single time. I did, the same, I did it to Kelly Dixon. I'm like, you can't call yourself lucky. <laughs> years and years of hard work and dedication and putting yourself in the right position and meeting the right people. And I believe in bad luck. I believe you cross the street and you get hit by a bus. Well, that sucks. Man, is that bad luck. But good luck, I believe that on such such a, a, a large scale, maybe there's a few percentage points of luck, but for the most part, you get to create it yourself. And the only thing that I can guarantee is not putting yourself out there, not connecting with people and not doing great work. Well, yeah, that's going to lead to a lot of bad luck. I'm pretty confident about that. But the good luck part, you also have as much control over that. Oh, yeah. But what I'm curious about now is uh, I do want to hear a little bit more in depth about the story of how you made this leap to Bill and Ted. And the, the way that I want to frame this uh, is you would basically come to me and said that based on having listened to one of my podcasts, and I want you to go into detail about who it was with, what was said, but you'd said that I kind of had this realization that I've never really gone after things that I want to work on before, but I, I decided that I had to go after this. So tell me the entire story from the very beginning, the kernel of inspiration, all the way until landing your dream gig on Bill and Ted. How did all this transpire? Yeah, so uh, so I was listening to your podcast and you were talking about pursuing Cobra Kai, which, you know, was one of those shows that I loved too. I mean, I, you know, I was born in 81. I watched the hell out of Karate Kid. It's like, that. that's the cool, how did, how did you make that happen? And I was just kind of thinking... I'm going to make it happen. And it was actually kind of kind of a, a combination of a couple of things. I was working on a project that, uh, in truth, was kind of killing my soul, which happens from time to time. And more just, often than not, I might <laughs> add. To yeah. Well, and that's why they find me. But, but I, and, I, and I say this, I say this as a means to offer some empathy to people, too. And it's sometimes the rough jobs content wise can be, you know, when I look back on what makes a job good. It's always the people, you know, sometimes the content is never, is never that interesting, but if you're working with good people, that as an aside, you know, but I was working on a job that was kind of making me miserable. And by, by just kind of reaching out to somebody, you know, to a friend, someone said, I thought they heard Bill and Ted was looking for someone. And I go, I heard Bill and Ted was happening. I didn't realize, oh man, they're going. So what ended up happening was the friend who told me about it actually got the studio wrong. He swore it was one studio. So I called up everybody I knew at the studio and they were either not mentioning the project by name or just not mentioning projects at all. And I kind of didn't want to be that, uh, that eager beaver going, can I get on this one project? So it eventually turns out I had another friend who was close with people at that studio and they said, oh, no, that's not one of ours. And I was like, Ah, uh, that means my my lead is a dead end, and I have no in. And I moped for about a day or two, and then I was just kind of sitting around, and I was thinking about that podcast. And again, like the phrase "fortune favors the bold" just kind of stuck in my head as this refrain. And I said, "Screw it, I'm going to make it happen anyway." And so I went onto IMDb. And I looked who was editing the project and I was able to pull up the editor, but I wasn't able to pull up any other information. So, and like, I'd looked up the director. He's this great guy, Dean Pariso. Uh, he did Galaxy Quest. I loved Galaxy Quest. And so 
I was just trying to see who do I know who knows this guy. And funny enough, uh, at the time, I started using Bill and Ted GIFs as, uh, or I suppose I pronounced that wrong, GIFs. Um, that's a, I could do a whole podcast just on GIF versus GIF and the history of that. Won't do that, but that uh, that could be an interesting aside. Oh, it's, that's, it's, it's a divisive one, you know? Yeah, it's its own thing. But anyway, carry on. So, so I started posting these, these graphics around as responses to everything in every Facebook message just because, one, it kind of amused me. And then I kind of uh, – that then I had this idea of – ooh, what if one of my friends is actually working on the project in, in this like super sneaky, you know, way of like, they'll go, oh, hey, that's mine. Well, you know, it didn't quite happen that way. But funny enough, I did that. And somebody put a, a love emoji on one of my comments. And I said, oh, are you on it? <laughs> and uh, this person wasn't. But coincidentally, I said, by any chance, you're not on the project, are you? And she says, no, I'm not. I wish I were. And I'm like, yeah, you know, because I'd, I'd looked up, I'd looked up the director and I saw he'd cut that show, Good Girls. And I reached out to everybody I knew who worked on Good Girls. Hey, do you, do you still talk to Dean? I'm just, I'm trying to get in contact with them. I already need someone. Still wasn't happening. So funny enough, just as, as, you know, the universe aligned, this person said, oh, no, but I just looked up on IMDb. Uh, this is the assistant editor. And I had looked up IMDb that morning. He was not listed that day. So within a matter of hours, I found out who the assistant editor was. So then I went through my list of friends and I said, who knows this guy? I just need to, I just need to reach out to him and see what happens. And so I found maybe three friends, three mutual friends via Facebook. And I went through those friends. And the problem with Facebook is, and we all do this, at least I do. And sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. I find I'll add most people if they're in the post community because I'm happy to help people. And I had friends of varying familiarity, some friends whom I felt close enough that I could ask a favor for, for and other friends who I would talk to, but I don't think... I would feel comfortable asking for a favor. So I narrowed it down to one person and I said, Hey, I don't, cause it was a friend I'd never worked with, but someone I respect a lot and I talk about craft. So I just told my friend, look, I don't want you to lie for me. Please don't tell him we've worked together because we haven't. I want to start this. I want to start this relationship honest, but would you just make an introduction, just an email? You don't need to follow up. You don't need to do anything. Just, I just want to, say hi, maybe see if I can take this guy out to coffee and just see what's up. So uh, my friend says, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And she sends an email and CCs herself, sends an uh, introduction email between the first assistant editor, associate editor, David Zimmerman, and myself. She just says, hey, this is my friend Richard. You know, I respect him a lot. Uh, he, you know, him and I talk shop all the time. And I decide at first I'm going to not jump in and geek out and scare him away. And I give it about a day. And then I just decide, you know what? He didn't respond. I'm just going to respond one more time and, and just kind of say, hey, man, you know, I thought I heard you were looking for a visual effects editor. You know, that's what I do. And man, I love this film so much. I, I would love to be a part of it. But you know what? I'm sure you guys are fully staffed. You know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you you asked for the, you needed a visual effects editor a week ago. I'm sure you got somebody. You know, just kind of one of those. I wanted to take the pressure off because in all in all probability, I I didn't think this was going to work, and so he still didn't get back to me, and you know that was a very expected response. Uh, I just imagined he was busy, which yes, he was. And so life goes on. And about a week later, I get a call from the post producer and this guy just out of nowhere goes, Hey Richard, uh, I'm post producing Bill and Ted. I'm like, uh, uh, <laughs> did, did that work? And so it was, it was kind of one of those things where, you know, there was a little bit of a little bit of canvassing, a little bit of reaching out to people, but I truly believe, you know, there's something to be said about the one thing I always try to do, and I'm a big fan of just cold introductions. And there's and I saw you did a podcast, a great podcast on the art of it, because it's challenging. And it's I mean, it's it's scary to put yourself out there. And to tell you the truth, I've given that advice and really never had a lot of great luck with it, but I've known people who have. So I treated it as a, well, Richard, statistically, you're going to send this email out and nothing's going to happen. But 
whatever, it cost me nothing. So I can, I can send an email. And, you know, again, by, I always tell people too, like, no one wants to hear the whole, like even tongue in cheek, like, Hey, if you need somebody, you know, so I just decided I'm just going to be a friend and see what happens. And, and they needed somebody and they were kind of in a bind. They're like, we need somebody like in like two days. Can you start in two days? And I was working on a project at the time. And even though, even though I kind of was looking for my next project, I still didn't want to leave them high and dry. So I was like, can I give them a week? And, and that's exactly what happened, you know? And I mean, yeah, it's, it's one of those things you jump into the deep end and it's, it, oh, the pressure is definitely on in, in this sense too. It's like, okay, now I really have responsibility, you know, after I came in and Hey everybody, I'm the perfect one for the job. No one knows this franchise more than me, la, 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 you know? Definitely the, the, the takeaway I, I had from that was just, just what's the worst they could do? The worst anyone can do via email is ignore you. And even if you, even if you annoy them, they're not going to remember you in two months. I mean, don't badger them is, you know, kind of the rationale I took. Yeah. And I, I would say that there, there is an A takeaway. There are many, many great takeaways from this story. I mean, I'm just going to like, you know, shoot and fish in a barrel. I'm just going to start going one by one by one because there's so many good little nuggets in here that I think we can dig in a little bit deeper and really extract what the, the essence is of the actions that you took. Um, the first one, which I think you said is the most important at the beginning, was the decision to decide to pursue this. Because like you said, the, the takeaway is what's the worst that can happen, right? And I think that so many people get so wrapped up in their heads, oh my God, I'm going to bother them or I'm going to annoy them or they're never going to respond, right? Well, they're only going to do that stuff if you approach them as a salesman. If you approach them as somebody that truly just wants to provide value to their world and make their lives easier, why in the world would they not want to get to know you better? Absolutely. Right? And that's the way you approach them was, hey, I'm really good at what I do. By the way, I'm crazy big fan of this franchise. Perfect fit, right? So you're coming at them knowing that you could provide them value, not, hey, I heard you guys already have your whole crew, but you know what? I would be even better and here's why. So you should replace your current visual effects editor with me because <laughs> I'm the man, right? Like, oh my God, that you want to talk about annoying and bothering people. I've seen that approach before. It does not work. But the fact that you decided to provide value to others, that was the approach that got you the email introduction that eventually got the post producer to call that got you the job is you were in the right place at the right time by putting yourself there. Mm -hmm. And and also, I, I do truly believe that there's something to be said because I often the, the other thing I try to do and I make a real effort to do this is when I watch a TV show or a movie that just really moves me and I just go, that was awesome. I'm going to find that editor and just find them, find their email, find them on Facebook and go, Hey, I just saw your episode. That was awesome. And sometimes they don't get back to me. Sometimes I get a friendly, Oh, that's cool. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And it's kind of one of those things where I take the notion of just, you know, make, make, make friends, build relationships. And it's so easy to, to do that. But touching on this specifically, it was one of those things where I think there was something to be said too about, I, I, I see people do this time and time again, and it always, it's never a good look. The, it's, it's the tongue in cheek making a joke out of asking for a job. And my, my mentality was like, if I'm going to ask for a job, I'm going to be deliberate about it. I'm just going to be straight up. Hey, I want to work for you. And you know, this is what I can bring to the table. And, and if you don't need me or whatever, that's cool, you know? But yeah, the, the, this tongue in, tongue in cheek, like, hey, if you're looking for some, I, I also always feel like the notion of if you're ever looking for someone kind of puts the onus on somebody you don't know. You're going, hey, I know you're really busy and you're working on a show that I like, but I want you to remember me if two months down the road you need someone. It's like, no, you can't put that on them. Yeah, do me a favor. Can you vouch for me and pass me along to all of your superiors and get me a job, even though we really have no connection whatsoever? And all I've done is sent you one email and attached my resume. Bingo. Oh, God, don't get me started. I could go on forever about horrible, horrible cold outreach. I get them multiple times a day. Um, I, had, I got an email from somebody two or three weeks ago that sent a cold message to just the contact page of my website. And it was like two paragraphs of their life story. And it finished with, would you mind checking out my Vimeo reel and giving me notes? What? 
No, I'm not giving you notes. I have no idea who you are. I barely have time to put my kids to bed at night. I'm not giving you notes, right? Yeah. So people, the, the, the worst approach is expecting for something to be given to you. You have to be willing to give first. So what I always tell people in my coaching and mentorship program, don't think, how can they help me walk around in a room full of people or think as you're going to be sending outreach emails, how can I help you? Yeah. You take that approach, your entire world is going to change. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, to, to your point, too, about helping people, it's one of those things whenever I hear, you know, the common question of like, you know, how do I, how do I network? And I was like, honestly, the easiest way to network for me personally is when you're in a Facebook forum and someone has a problem, they go, hey, how do I fix this? If you got the answer, give the answer. You know, you build community and over time people recognize this. Hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. Uh, and, and, I, and I would say that you have, you have parlayed that not into a guy that gives value in Facebook forums and uh, community groups, but you are basically a, a co-founder of what is now the industry standard resource for anybody that wants to become an assistant in either TV or features. I appreciate the kind words. Yes. Yeah. The uh, master of the workflow program that uh, my, my editor and friend, Larry Jordan put together. Yeah. We put that together to, uh, to get assistant editors up to speed on the feature film editorial workflow. And it's, it's been going great. People have been loving it. Yeah. I mean, it's really is at the point where people talk about it, like it's some certification program that they just have to do before they want to pursue um, the job of assistant editing and scripted. I hear it in my program all the time where people will say, yeah, I'm in the process of, you know, getting all my ducks in a row and I'm working in reality right now. I'm going to scripted. And of course I've already done the master of the workflow course. Like it's just assumed. Like you just have to do it. It's like, well, if I have to be a doctor, I have to do my residency and my internship and got to do master the workflow. And I'm like, how did you guys do that? Five years ago, it didn't exist. And now it's an industry standard. Like that's brilliant. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, how did it become the industry standard so quickly? You know, the funny thing is when it started, it actually, I was trying to solve a problem because I was building uh, my database and I was working with Larry on a film called Naked for Netflix. And I had recently, I spent a large part of my career hoping I would never have to learn FileMaker Pro. As we all feel, by the way. <laughs> and I decided one day I'm just going to dive into it. And I had such a hard time learning it. Uh, I had to, so I eventually reached out to a couple, you know, really good first assistant editors and some really good VFX editors just in, in, until someone would give me the time of day. I just said, hey, you know, I'm trying to learn this. Do you have like an old database that I could just look at? I just want to see how you organize shots. You know, I'm not going to use it. I just want to see how you do it. And I eventually found somebody who, who's like, here's an old one. I haven't used it, used it in years. Yeah, just have a look. And from there, I started building, you know, you build calculations and you build these automated fields and, you know, hey, I'm having this problem. I heard you're a really good file maker. Do you know, how do I solve this? And through that, I built some really good friendships with some really good people. But what I was doing is at the time, I kind of I kind of hit a point where I got a little, actually not a little, I got a lot obsessive about building this database. And I said, I'm going to build the most comprehensive FileMaker database ever. And, you know, I'm going to help people who want to learn FileMaker. And I'm, I'm going to make my FileMaker database a, a product. I'm going to sell it. And in that process... The biggest problem I had was how do I prevent piracy, you know? And so, because it's, it's just a file. You can just hand it out everywhere. And so I started writing a manual, and the manual was 16 pages, and it was really hard to follow. And so right around that time, we were finishing up Naked, and Larry goes you know, like that database is pretty cool. You know, like, have you, like, we should do something like a class, like to teach people how to do this. And it kind of hit me all at once. I was like, the manual was way too difficult to follow. So if we just taught this class and I can just include this database as part of that of, Hey, this is what I use and you can have it and work with it and make it your own. And let's just take, let's just take the process of, you know, teaching someone how to be a good feature assistant editor. And it was one of the, cause the other problem I always had is when you sit down to shadow someone, if you're in dailies, you get to learn how to do dailies, but you don't get to learn how to do turnovers. And if you're in turnovers, you don't get to learn how to do temp visual effects. So it was kind of one of those things where it's like, oh, 
I could just buy some screen capture software. I can find some footage to work with and then we can just kind of record it and just simulate the experience of having someone sit over my shoulder for the whole process. That would be amazing. And, you know, we got, like, I try to approach it from the standpoint you know, people get, get very dogmatic about their way of working. You know, this is the right way and every other way is wrong. And I, always, I try to bring to it the sense of this is not the right way. This is not the wrong way. This is the way I've done it. I've delivered many films this way. You can do this and maybe you don't have to do all of it. You can do some of it if you like that. And, oh, and here's my database too. This makes my life easier. You also don't have to use it, but you know, might make your life easier too. And it's kind of one of those things you find with FileMaker, especially people get very possessive about their databases. And I understand why there's a lot of time that goes into the databases. I find for me, I'm not overly possessive about it, mainly because every show is different and the needs of every show are different. So basically my database has never been the same way twice on any film because I've always needed to track things a little differently per show. So there's this kind of this idea of if I give this away, I personally don't feel like I'm losing anything or spilling some major secret because on the next show, it's going to be different anyway. And that's fine. And my hope is that somebody will take it and not just take it and use it for what it is, but take it and reverse engineer it and figure out how they can build solutions on top of mine. And then maybe one day when I'm having a problem that I can't figure out, one of my students is going to come up to me and go, oh, I figured that out. Check this out. I'll be like, oh my God, that's great. You know, everybody wins. Yeah. And I think that the, in today's day and age, the information or the, the database, so to speak, so little in value compared to having somebody show you how to apply the knowledge and then how to be able to apply the knowledge to your own situation, which I think is where the value and master of the workflow is. But what I also find so intriguing and fascinating is that this started as this database is cool. Let's see if we can sell it and do a few tutorials on it. And now at this point, the database is like, oh yeah, by the way, we have a database, right? Like it's it's such a small part of it where I've had multiple people, especially those that work in TV, I've asked them multiple times, talk to me about master the workflow. I want to know if this thing really works because I want to recommend it if it does. Like, to be perfectly frank, I'm never going to go through the entire course because there's <laughs> no reason for me to spend the hours doing it. But I trust the people that are in my program and my colleagues, and they all pretty much say the same thing. It totally prepared me for making the transition into scripted and understanding the whole workflow Either the database thing, they say, oh, yeah, it was cool. I'm never going to need it. Or they say it was really cool. But it's kind of like a, an extra added thing where, yeah, this is – it's – you know, neat or something I might use someday, or I'm never going to use it. And FileMaker has no interest to me, but nobody has ever said, yeah, because the database thing is in there, the program really wasn't worth it to me because I don't need it. The program has so much value because it answers the quintessential question that everybody trying to get into scripted has, which is – what do I actually need to know to do the job because nobody will tell me? I feel like you guys finally opened up the curtain and said, here's everything you need to know to be prepared. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's it, it, the fact of the matter is, too, you know, because I didn't go to film school. I mean, I've kind of been of the mindset for a while that, I mean, there's really not a lot of insider secrets anymore, you know, with great websites like Creative Cow and social media, which is humongous for that. The, the real shame about you know, Facebook is the shelf life of questions is so much shorter than old forums like uh, that, like Creative Cow. And Creative Cow is great because you know so much of that stuff comes up on searches, your Google searches and whatnot. So it lasts longer. But I see less and less traffic on it, which is a shame because it's you know it's great. Um, but the, yeah, those through those avenues, there's so much information. It all changes so quickly, and new techniques abound every day. It was just kind of one of those opportunities to kind of aggregate everything I learned and go, take this, like, try it out, you know? Because, I mean, I certainly remember, I certainly remember my first, one of my first scripted interviews, and they asked me straight up uh, a question that I actually knew, but I knew it by a different name. And because I gave them the look of the deer in the headlight, I didn't get the job. And I knew in that moment, I didn't get the job. They looked at me and they said, do you know Scripter? And I go, I don't know Scripter. And like, they, they kind of gave me that look and, you know, like in a Warner Brothers cartoon, I blinked and it sounded like a xylophone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that the interview went away. And then I, I called up a friend and I said, Hey, have you ever heard of Scripter? He goes, Oh yeah, it's Script Sync. I know what Script Sync no. is. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's that, that's hilarious. And I think that anybody listening to this has been in that situation at least once where the nomenclature is so different and everybody has their own variables for how they say this or that or the other thing. But at the end of the day, the job is pretty similar, whether you're scripted in TV, whether you're in features, there are nuances. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's just all about naming. And, um, and actually on that point, I would love to share if there's another thing I'd love to share uh, with everybody listening here is the value of this phrase that I didn't know at the time and I wish I did, which is if someone asks you, do you know something, never tell them no. I often say now, I think I know what you're talking about, perhaps by a different name. Could you Mm. tell me what you mean when you say that? Because the fact of the matter is, if you do know it by another name, you're still in the game. But if you tell them you don't know, you're out. That phrase could be worth tens of thousands of dollars, my friends. (laughs) That is an excellent, excellent turn of phrase to to save yourself from uh, being turned away in an interview. That's brilliant. So what what I'm curious about now is uh, going back a little bit to where you said, I've got this database and I think I want to sell it. Oh, you know what would actually be cool? Let's kind of, let's walk everybody through the actual process of what it's like to be an assistant editor and features and kind of give them this bullet point list. I'm assuming that when you first put together your table of contents and your schedule for shooting, that everything came out exactly the way that you'd plan in the beginning in the exact amount of time, correct? Yes, because it always goes that way. Of course it does. <laughs> yes, you can sense the sarcasm in my voice. You yes, know? As a fellow content creator, I'm right there with you, my friend. And I would love to know a little bit more about the, the journey to get this thing to the finish line. Yeah. So, you know, it was kind of one of those things where I wanted, I wanted to treat it as a casual experience. You know, I didn't want it to be just a very dry academic, something you, you, you stare at, you know, blank faced. So I, I wrote out a basic table of contents and I was like, okay, these are, these are the processes I want to cover. These are the phrases I want to cover. And then I just kind of, I kind of just got the data in and said, Let's do it, you know? And actually, the biggest problem we had in the beginning was we needed footage. Because I remember uh, we were like, you know, we're working on this film for Netflix. It would be cool if Netflix gave us footage, but that's never going to happen. No studio is just going to go, oh, yeah, take our content and use it for something else. So what was a lifesaver for us was, uh, you know, I'd certainly seen Misha Tannenbaum's, his podcast that he'd done with Moviola and whatnot for a while. You know, he's done all sorts of great, uh, all sorts of great um, podcasts on being a visual effects editor and whatnot. And he has the company Edit Stock. So I just reached out to him. I didn't know him. And I just said, hey, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've seen what you've done with Edit Stock. I think it's really cool. This is a class that I have in mind and I want to do this. This, would you be willing to to license it to us? And at first, you know, he just it, it was just a very business relationship. Just okay, you know, I'll do this and I'll do this and it'll cost this much. And over time, I think we we earned his trust by seeing what we were doing. Because one of one of the big problems too we had was you look at so many of these tutorials online, you know, and it's always these you take a QuickTime and you import it, and the QuickTime gets turned into MXF, and it's like that's cool. But that's not the way a dailies lab delivers you footage. Never. And so, and so those little nuances are the important things so that when someone hands you an Avid bin, an ALE, and a bunch of MXF files, you know how to bring it in. And so the first step was I got all this footage. It was shot, I think it was shot on a red cam. And that's great if you're working in Premiere, but what I did was I, I brought it into Resolve and I said, I'm going to treat this like it's a dailies house. So I'm going to transcode all of this footage and I'm going to make MXF media. I'm going to make myself ALEs with CDL values and I'm going to get Avid bins and just make it all. And as I was doing it, I made a few mistakes. And at first I was like, wait, should I fix those mistakes? And then I said, no, I'm going to keep those mistakes in there because we certainly get mistakes from the labs, you know, in editorial. So I was like, I'm going to intentionally keep those in and put the onus on the students to go, there are mistakes here. And I'm not going to tell you where they are. You need to find them and there'll be different ways of mitigating them. But it's important that you don't go, there's a mistake. I can't do anything. No, there's a mistake. Now you need to figure it out. Yeah, I'm I'm right in the same camp with you where whenever I'm shooting my materials or I'm shooting something for um, LinkedIn learning, whatever it is, any kind of a tutorial, if I hit a snag and it's a matter of, oh, wait, this was a, not if it was just like a stupid mistake, like I stepped over my words or I clicked the wrong button. But if I did the action that I was intending to do and it was wrong, that's not a cut. That's all right. So I made this mistake. Let's let me let's I want to help you understand why I made this choice. Now let's figure it out together. 
then you almost feel like the teacher's in the room with you when you make the same dumb mistake yourself. And it gives them more of this feeling of trust, like, oh, this person is just figuring it out the way that I am. So I, I love that that's your approach to all this. Yeah. And, and especially, you know, I think there's, there's something, there's something to be said about, you know, knowing that people who you work with and you look up to and respect are very fallible people. You know, I, I have like a distinct number of, I probably have two first assistant editors that I keep in my mind that are sort of my beacons of, you know, when I'm having a rough day and I feel like I'm just going to lose it and scream at someone, you know, I have to step back and go, first of all, screaming at somebody is not going to help anything. And I'll, I'll give a shout out to my buddy, Sam Restivo. He's the first assistant editor on Robin Hood and he was amazing. He's kind of one of those guys that be like Sam, just be like Sam, just be like Sam, you know, but, uh, but I think it, it, but it's important too, because, you know, like we all have those days and we're humans. It's okay to make a mistake, but I think there's this, there's this idea in this, in this field because there's so much pressure. The deadlines are so tight. There's so much money on the line and it's such a competitive field. You know, there's always somebody waiting in the wings who wants the same job you have that it's hard to go, I can't make a single mistake because if I do, I'm going to get fired. And then if I get fired, then I'm never going to work again. And it's like, slow down. It's okay. All you got to do is fix it. We just create entertainment for a living. We're not curing cancer. <laughs> Although the studio executives want to prove otherwise and treat us as such. But don't get me started on all of that. I saw a great comic uh, a while ago, and it looked like it was a far side comic, but it was these surgeons, and they're working on somebody, and they say, it's okay, it's not like we work in television. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that, that's, what, that, that's exactly the, the story that I tell all the time. But we just get so wrapped up in what we're doing and the, the stress of all of it. It's like, at the end of the day, we're making television, we're making movies, we're making stuff that people are going to consume while they're on their couch consuming other bad things. So we're, we make visual popcorn for a living. Let's get over ourselves and enjoy the process just a little bit more. Yeah. So the, the next question that I have for you is given that you've built a community of what I presume is hundreds of people that have said, I want to learn how to break into scripted. I want to learn the scripted workflow, whether it's features or TV. What I'm wondering is in the, the community that you have, because I know this is an aspect of it, what do you find are the most common challenges or roadblocks that people are constantly hitting up against? Not necessarily as far as workflow or tech, but as far as the politics of the industry and making a transition from reality or some other medium, trying to get into the scripted world. I mean, any way you look at it, the same problem exists for everybody, which is, you know, hey, I have, I finished your course, but I have no experience and no credits. How do I get someone to take my email? That's a common thing. And honestly, time and time again, I just keep on telling people, go to these networking events, be nice. I mean, I can't even tell you how important be kind is. Just be kind. Getting, getting to know people, working on the kind of shows that you want to work on, making friends. And then one day, hey, you know, I, I, I think we need someone. And you, you, you took that course, right? You, you know a little bit about what we need to do. Yeah, okay, yeah. I could probably get you in as a second. And I mean, I have a really good friend who, uh, she took our course. She was awesome. I mean, she ended up doing, I think she did the pilot for the Dark Tower for Amazon, which unfortunately di didn't get picked up. But I remember when she told me that, I was like, are you kidding me? I'm jealous of you. You know, just, I mean, it's, it's one of those things is it is, it's somewhat of a, it's a persistence game. The first job is always the hardest job. I mean, there's no way around that. You know, the first, the first job is always your hardest job. And especially the one thing I always tell people, and it's not a means to discourage people, but it's rather a means to get people thinking realistically is, and this just comes from my standpoint of having started in reality, transitioned over to scripted work is for me. My first scripted job was not preceded by my second scripted job. And my first union job was not preceded by my second union job. And if you get stuck in that mentality, like, oh, I'm not, I'm not moving upward, I'm moving laterally, which means I'm doing something wrong. No, that's just kind of how it goes. You know, you just, but you meet people, you build your network. And again, if you're kind enough to enough people, 
I promise you things are going to work out. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I couldn't say it better myself. I think that's uh, that's the best advice that you can give anybody in any field whatsoever mm-hmm. is that you're, you're never going to go wrong by being nice to other people. It is going to open plenty of doors for sure. Yeah, yeah. On that note, I don't think I can ask a better question to finish in a better place than we just did. Um, I don't know how to give better advice than that. The, the only other thing that I can think to say, maybe an area where – I don't disagree with you, but I maybe want to, to add one little, uh, one little point here is that I don't think the first job is the hardest. Oh, really? I, I think the second job is the hardest. I hear this from people over and over and over again, and it's also an experience that I had. And I think that what you said and pointed to is so important for people to understand that when they say I'm in reality, I've been doing reality for years. Oh, my God, I finally, finally got in the door and I landed scripted. I'm now a scripted assistant editor. Yeah, I'd slow your roll there, buddy. Yeah, you get you got one script the job. Getting the second one might be even harder, and it's okay if you need to pay the bills and go back to what you're doing before. It's not a step backwards. It's not even a lateral step. You're still moving forwards, but guess what? You have to survive. You need to pay your bills. You need to maintain your lifestyle. There is no harm whatsoever in going back and forth. And I think this is a big revelation that I see in my program all the time, where when I explain my transition, and I've made four transitions from various mediums, from trailers to indie features to studio features to scripted TV, like different genres. Like I've jumped all over the place. Like transition is basically my middle name in this, this career. But every single time, there's this invisible portion of my resume that people don't see, where I spend years bouncing back and forth between the two until one of them really settles in. So, for example, I spent years cutting really low budget indie sales trailers for movies that had total budgets of like two hundred thousand dollars. And these uh, small independent companies would come to me and say, we have five movies. We're going to a sales conference in Berlin. Can you cut these five trailers in two weeks? I'm like, hell yeah, I will. They'd give me some money. I would cut them. And then that would fund me for the next two months to work on whatever I needed to to build up my craft or build up my resume. Nobody sees that on IMDb. And I think it's so important to understand it's okay to jump back and forth while you're making the transition. And sometimes it's going to take years for it to stick. And, you know, and and to your point, I also kind of think... I think there's a value in that, having worked in multiple fields and having multiple contacts across these different these different areas of post is I like to think about it as, you know, especially with the direction that our economy is going over the past couple of weeks, I think about it as a diversified investment portfolio. And if you have a multitude of people you can reach out to, you're kind of in a uniquely good place. I mean, it's I, I'm I'm always impressed by these people who I've worked with the same team for 20 years and I've, and that's really cool and that's amazing. But by the same time, if that is the team you've been locked into for a very long time, if that team starts to wane, you might wane with it. And all the transition and as difficult as that is, there's something to be said about, oh man, this, this avenue's kind of gone dry for a little while why don't I give that guy a call and just kind of see what's up? And yeah, like you say, I mean, th- there's to your point also about the, uh, the second job there's once you have a taste for something you like, you know, it's just normal human nature to go, this is all I'm ever going to do ever again. And that'd be cool, but yeah, it may not work out that way. And just keeping your head in the game and being realistic and again, being kind, you know, there's nothing worse than people who have done it a little bit, and then they get cocky and they get arrogant. And then you're that guy on the film that nobody wants to be around. And it's never, that, that never ends good for anybody. Yeah. You definitely don't need to be that guy. Maybe, maybe it goes against everything you see in the, the movies and the, the TV shows thinking, Oh yeah, once I am successful, I get to be a prick. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Be nice to everybody. I don't care how big you are or where you are on the call sheet or anything else. Be nice. I've seen number ones on call sheets that have never gotten work again because they treated the crew like crap. Word gets around. People want to work with other nice people. So the least you can do, especially with how small our niche of the industry is, it is so important to be nice because everybody knows everybody. And at some point, you're going to meet somebody that remember that you were an ass or whatever it was, and it's going to get back to somebody else. It's going to cost you a lot of money. So just be nice to people for the yeah. love. Yeah. Like that, that's, that's really the, that's the, the golden rule. So, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, and, and it becomes all the more difficult too. I mean, I feel like everybody has that celebrity story where, oh, I met him. He was an a-hole. And, and it's so hard to discern the difference between being 
generally an unpleasant person and having a bad day. And therein lies the real challenge because we all have bad days. And, you know, and just someone says, hey, man, how you doing? And you're like, it's like, just it's never worth it. Just be just be cool. Couldn't agree more. Uh, well, as, uh, as two fellow craftsmen and editors whose uh, life is all about timing. We have reached our time here, and I want to be very respectful of yours. But before we go, I want to make sure that anybody listening can find you, can reach out to you specifically, and more importantly, or just as importantly, I should say, can find out more information about how they can enroll in Master the Workflow. So tell us how anybody can get a hold of you or learn more about the program. So honestly, the best way to get a hold of me is Facebook. I know uh, I, I'm not on uh, any of the uh, newer, hipper uh, social media services. I have a Twitter account, but I never use it. Same thing with, uh, with uh, Instagram. Facebook is honestly a great way to get a hold of me. And uh, as far as Master the Workflow goes, check out www.mastertheworkflow.com. Uh, the thing with it is you want to get on the waiting list. So uh, some people are a little unclear about it, but the way we do it is we open up enrollment at intervals. And the reason we do that is I want to make sure that when people sign up for our class, if they have questions, that they can get to me directly and I can respond to them quickly because the the concern is that if we have open enrollment all the time and we have a massive influx of people, it turns into a situation where I have 50 questions and I can't possibly answer them all because I'm also a working visual effects editor. So we'll open it, we open it up at intervals and students can come on in and... And we can get you up and running. Yep, and I've, I can very much relate to all of that. I've made the mistake of opening my courses in a little bit more of an evergreen format because I wanted everybody to have access. And all of a sudden, I was getting pummeled with Facebook questions and comments and emails. I was like, crap, I'm in the middle of an editor's cut. I can't help these people. Oh, this is why people do enrollment periods. I get it now. So now I basically just treat it like it's college courses, and I do it by the the, the semester calendar. So that way I know that there are certain weeks where my entire focus and dedication is enrolling people, helping them, getting them on board. And then after that, I can disappear into the ether for months in the dark and then do it all over again. So, well, this has been an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad we were able to make it happen. And I appreciate you providing the tremendous advice and support and inspiration that you did. So thank you so much for coming on the show today, Richard. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Zach. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast. To access the show notes for this and all previous episodes, as well as to subscribe so you don't miss future interviews just like this one, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash podcast. If you're inspired by Richard's journey today and you would like to up your networking game, specifically your outreach emails, then I invite you to download a free copy of my insider's guide to writing great outreach emails. In this guide, I break down the process of writing outreach emails so you understand exactly what will get you a response. I'll teach you why cold outreach is the most important soft skill you must develop if you want to advance your career, especially during global pandemics. I'll show you the five most common mistakes that people make when they write their outreach messages, and then I will break down step by step how to write an amazing outreach message that will actually get a response so you can seek advice, connect with a potential mentor, and build the right relationships so that when the job market does open again, you are at the top of people's lists. To download this brand new guide for free, visit optimizeyourself.me slash email guide, all one word. This episode was made possible for you by, you guessed it, Ergo Driven, the creators of the Topo Mat, my number one recommended product if you are interested in moving more and not having sore feet at your height adjustable or standing workstation. Almost every new person that I meet in this industry starts our conversation with, hey, I got a Topo Mat because of you. It's changed my life. Thank you. Listen, standing desks are only great if you're actually standing well. Otherwise, you are just fighting fatigue and chronic pain. Not like any other anti-fatigue mat, the Topo is scientifically proven to help you move more throughout your day, which helps reduce discomfort and also increases your focus and your productivity. I'm literally standing on one as I read this, and I don't go to a single job without it. And if you're smaller and concerned the Topo mat might be too big, or you simply don't have the floor space, well, there's a Topo Mini for that. To learn more, visit optimizeyourself.me slash Topo. That's T-O-P-O. -O.